Today's scripture reading is Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks, Phoebe. Okay, welcome back. Is on? Yes, it is. I think it is. Good morning. Welcome again to Redeemer Lincoln Square. I was uh, perusing the, it's my, I, I'm going to show my age. I was thinking I was on Facebook and I was, you know, in my feed and uh, a big statistic came up. It was, the, it was from the U.S. Census report and it was looking at U.S. households, percentage of U.S. households between 1960 and 2023. And it points out that the share of households of people living alone have, has actually gone up double from around 13% to 30% over those 60 years. Households with married parents has gone down from 44%, almost triple to 17%. And the percentage of, of households defined as other, which is uh, households that are cohabitating or unmarried couples, has doubled from 8 to 16%. And so in 60 years... That's a massive demographic shift that's happening culturally, and it's happening for lots of different reasons. So I don't want to say there's only one reason, right? Causation, correlation. But one of the reasons why it's happening is because our culture is changing on its views about how we regard our bodies and our sexual behaviors. That's why we've been doing this mini-series on this topic, because right now there, is, there are competing Narratives that are competing stories of what's going to actually bring the good life for us. And I think it's valid for us to say, well, to weigh these and see what they say. That, there's a competing vision about what will lead to human flourishing when it comes to our bodies. And I think it's fair to us to have a, a, a discussion about it. We have only two, we have, we have this week and next week, so it's a very short mini series. But let me start with this and affirm that those of you in the room that feel very sensitive about this topic, you're valid. And the reason why you're valid is because the church hasn't done a good job talking about this. The church has both de-emphasized or under-emphasized and over-emphasized this topic. The church has under-emphasized this topic because there have been times when the culture, let me, let me re-say that, We've, the church has under-emphasized this topic because The culture has done a very good job of clearly saying that you will be happiest if you get to do what you want, wherever you want, with whomever you want with your body. That's in our movies, it's in our art, it's in our culture. It's very clear. It's it's assumed by most people. I grew up in this town. It's assumed by most people here that that will lead to the greatest amount of good. And the the church at these times has done a poor job of of de-emphasizing or underemphasizing how their view is actually positive, about how their view actually is a good thing. It underemphasizes how the biblical sexual ethic found inside a lifetime covenant marriage promotes safety, comfort, and acceptance, that it leads to the, the most amount of human flourishing, that it leads to the least amount of commodification and the most amount of security, that it's pro-women, that it's pro-men, that it leads to an ability to be fully known and fully loved, potentially. I think the church has under-emphasized that. And the beauty and the comfort. At the same time, I feel like the church has over-emphasized sex when it frames the problem as, the problem is with these people over here. The problem is with these amoral, undesirable, broken people over here. There's, there's, there's us over there and there's them over, over here. Which I find highly problematic because the founder of the, the faith, Jesus, tended to attract 
people who were known as undesirable and broken. So then why is it that churches, supposedly in Jesus' name, repeal people who would be considered broken and amoral? It's because I think those inside the church and outside the church misunderstand the Christian view of sex, and I think therefore Christianity itself. So I want to do this morning, just for a little bit of time, is I want to look at this text that we have before us, which many people define one of the most you know, condemning and, and, and harsh phrases. And I, I would like to try to show you that it's actually a statement of freedom. I want to propose that, it's act, that what Jesus is offering is freedom in this text. You say, how's that possible? Well, whether you're a Christian here or not, we assume that there, we have everybody in the room. We assume that, everybody, there's, that the entire uh, spectrum of belief is here. Whether you're from the church or, or not from the church. Let's look at three things. What's wrong with lust? What's it actually look like? And then what will actually make us right? What's wrong with lust? What will, what will, uh, what's it actually look like? And then what will make it right? So first, what's wrong with lust? It's important to point out that Jesus is preaching to people who already know what the Bible says about sex. That the people in this text that Jesus is talking to had memorized the Ten Commandments. The people in this text had, had grown up in a world where that adultery was wrong. So in verse 27, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. It's because they had known that already. Which I find very interesting then in verse 28, he says, but I say unto you, or I say to you, in other words, translation, you think you know what the biblical sexual ethic is, but you really don't. I find that highly interesting. That he goes to people who, who say they know what's going on here. You think you know what's going on, but you don't. It's not just something that happens externally. See, these people grew up thinking, oh, okay, the biblical view of sex is that sex is between a man and a woman in a, in a bond of marriage, and as long as that happens, I'm good to go. And Jesus is saying, no, look at verse 28. He says, it's something that actually happens in your heart. I tell you, anybody who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. So let me be the first to tell you what Jesus is not saying in this text. He is not saying all sexual desires are lust. How do I know that? Well, first, he could have easily have said that. But secondly, I know that because if you read the rest of the Bible, read Proverbs, read the Song of Solomon, what you will find there are extremely sex-positive depictions of relationship between a husband and a wife. You read the Song of Solomon, and, and it's, you know... <laughs> You, 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 there's so many euphemisms of, of, of uh, palm trees and, uh, you know, gazelles and, and all this, these beautiful things because there's this overflow of poetry at the beauty and wonder of the body. And so it, the Bible's not prudish about sexual desire. So whatever Jesus is saying here, he's not against sexual desire. There's a distinction between lust and uh, sexual desire. What I love about the Bible, the Bible doesn't, doesn't say suppress sexual desire. It also doesn't say follow it. If you go to our text again, and it says, you should not look at a woman lustfully. The word look in the Greek, the tense, the grammar, it's a present active participle. And for those grammar people, what that means is that this is not a glancing look. This is a present, ongoing, continuous look. So this is not a, like a, hey, you're walking down the street and you, know, you can't help but see something. This is where your gaze stays. And it has the context. It's associated with a, with a greedy, inordinate desire. So I want to parse that out. What is a greedy, inordinate desire? First, let's look at the greed part. Here's what greed is. It's not, greed is not, just, it's not about money. David had money. Abraham had money. Lots of people in the Bible had money, and they still loved God, and they still loved others. The problem isn't necessarily with, with money. Greed is when you hold on to money for yourself. Greed is actually not about the money. It's what you get to do with that money. And what Jesus is saying here by using this term in that way is he's saying that's what lust is. Lust is a type of greed where you want a person for who they are and not, sorry, you want a person for what they do for you and not for who they are. 
Jesus is saying that lust wants the body but not the person. Lust dehumanizes each other because what it does is it says, how can I commodify and use this, this person in my life? So that's actually what's happening when you look, when, uh, when there's pornography or auto-excitation, all these types of, of, of lust is saying I want an experience from a person but not the, the full person themselves. You're using them or an idea of them or an image of them. And so when you walk down the street and you see people who are beautiful, this is, there's nothing wrong with acknowledging beauty. Um, in fact, we talk about beauty here all the time. That, that, that there's, a, there's a valid, name, you know, when you see beauty, you're supposed to acknowledge it. It's, it gr- lust is to go in the next step in saying, not just that that's beautiful, that person, he or she is beautiful. It's saying, I want that, I need that, I have to have that for me. That doesn't actually care about the needs of that person, where they're from, their hurts, their, their issues, their, their wonders, their beauties. And so that tends to then consume and take from them. You commodify that person. And you, that dehumanizes them and it dehumanizes you. And I think it leads to breakdown. That's why the Bible is against sex outside of marriage. It's not about, you know, uh, um, control. It's not about trying to keep people down. It's saying what's actually going to lead to the most amount of good. And it says that, the, that it's not the way that we treat each other when we say, I just want to use you for you, for me. That's actually why last week we talked about how the Bible defines marriage as an exclusive permanent covenant where you're not just naked physically, you're naked spiritually, emotionally, economically, and legally. See, when you're naked just physically, you're actually, you're, you're, you, you can see my physical imperfections, but I'm not going to be naked with you in any other way in my life. That leads to brokenness. That fractures us. No wonder we feel lonely. No wonder that we, we don't feel fully known because you're only knowing part of me but not all of me. The Bible's all for sex and nakedness, right, as we just showed you in, the, uh, in lots of different biblical passages. It just wants that in a space where you're naked in all different phases as well. That will lead to more beauty and more wonder and more glory. Without it, though, it leads to the brokenness. It leads to the lust. It leads to, it, lust leads to that. In other words, biblical marriage is where it's possible to holistically be self-giving and serving of the other. Because when you're open to them and they're open to you, you can actually acknowledge each other and be with each other. Adultery in the heart is where you're giving to yourself. It's self-centered. It's not other-centered. And so lust is greed. It's secondly also an inordinate desire. If you say, I have to have sex to be happy, or if you say, I have to be in a marriage to be happy, or if you say, I have to be single to be happy, each one of those phrases is basically, Jesus calls that inordinate or, or uh, disordinate desire. Because what you're, and that's why he uses this language, by the way, about plucking your eye out or cutting your, your, your hand off, which sounds very extreme at first. Until you realize what you're doing is that you're asking from marriage or you're asking from a relationship or a person to give you a warmth and security that only God could actually give you. That's why you can lust after your career, by the way. Right? You don't want the full, when you lust after your career, you don't want the full aspect of what a career means, which is, is uh, it's all the hardship, it's the photocopying, it's the, um, you know, the annoying other coworkers. You know, you, when you lust after your career, you're using your career to give you something that only God can actually give you to feel good to feel an accomplished, to feel better about yourself. You're sleeping with your job because your job can't love you back the way that you need to be loved. And so there's nothing wrong with having a, des- a desire to have a career. There's nothing wrong with having a desire to have a family or have a relationship in your life. It's inordinate when it's disordered, when it's out of the proper prioritization. And so what God is actually saying is, what Jesus is actually saying is, don't try to get things from, from each other, from stuff that you can only get from God. It won't work. What Jesus is saying here is until God becomes the lover of your soul, you're going to try to make someone or something else that, and it will ruin you and it will ruin them in the process. Lust 
tries to get from others, love gives. Lust takes, love serves. Lust consumes, love commits. Lust uh, dine and dashes, love stays. The Bible is not saying don't have desires. Please hear me say that. It's not saying don't have desires. It's saying you need, we need to order them the right way because if we don't, maybe the reason why things are not the way they're supposed to be, maybe the reason why we deep down know that we're not actually uh, caring for each other and loving each other and serving each other, maybe why we're feeling lonely and broken and disordered, it's because we're not holistically actually treating each other as we should. Now, that's, that's number one. Number two, then, practically, what does that look like? What does that actually look like? Don't, and this is, I need to come back to this. Don't lose the point. Jesus is talking to people who already know adultery is wrong. So what that means is, what, if you're here today, whatever I'm saying, I'm not telling you just you need to know adultery is wrong. That's already, Jesus is already assuming that. He's talking to religious people who believe already in this command. Which means... What he's trying to get at is, that's your problem. You think that if you just understand that, then you're good. See, the biggest problem with religious people is they think the problem is external to themselves and not internal. That it's a matter of the heart. That's why he keeps saying it's a matter of the heart. That religious people don't understand they're at the center of themselves is is a lustful brokenness. So follow the logic here. Adultery happens when you lust. Lust happens in the heart. And it's when you want an experience of a person instead of the full person themselves. So when you use somebody for, the, for your needs, and you, instead of serving them in their needs, when you define it that way, that means everybody has an adulterous heart. Why? Because I don't believe anybody in this room, whether you're married, single, Widow, divorce, I don't believe anybody in this room fully treats the other person, in, the other persons in our lives in the way that they deserve. And guess what? You're not being treated that way either. Defined that way, that means an adulterous heart is, is where nobody serves or cares or loves the way that we should. That's why Paul says in Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why in Ephesians 2, Paul says again, you are dead in your transgressions. A dead person can't undead themselves. And therefore, if that's true, it isn't just this group over here who has the problem. Every person, every individual, married, single, divorced, and everything in between is in the space. Now, if you're like, this series bums me out because (laughs) all you talk about is that we're broken, I think you're missing out. If you're like, Michael, you just sat here for the first couple minutes and just told us we're all (laughs) messed up. How's that good news? Let me give you two reasons. Number one, if this is true, if everybody's in the same boat, that completely changes the context in how we talk about this topic. It moves us away from us versus them. It moves us away from uh, the bony finger of shame over here. It moves us into... Join the club. So that means those with body dysmorphia is not, are not more broken than those that are in a heterosexual uh, marriage that are not, and are not more broken than a single individual who's in their 60s. This is incredibly, I think this is incredibly comforting to know that we're all in the same boat. To know that there's no type of brokenness. But I think it can also be very freeing. You know how freeing it could be for a, a, a married couple to say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. That, that, that there are ways that we treat each other physically in marriage, outside of marriage, that's like, this is not okay. I think it's very freeing to be able to say, like, hey, this is, this is hurt. This is hard. Not just uh, about our physical nakedness, but our emotional nakedness, our spiritual nakedness. And if doing so, what it does is it, it means that nobody can act superior to somebody else. I think the church gets in trouble when it, it elevates one type of adultery over another type of adultery. If we're all fallen, then it's welcome to the party. It doesn't remove shame and guilt, but what it does do is it gives us the ability to actually talk about all our different versions. Now, secondly, I think it's good news because 
you don't go looking for a solution until you know something needs to be fixed. What do I mean by that? If you want a fun, uh, like, historical thing to do, go to 29 Washington Place. It's uh, now part of the NYU system of buildings. On uh, the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of that building, back in March 25th, 1911, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was making blouses. And it was a factory filled with women. But on March 25th, 1911, what most people think was a, a discarded cigarette or maybe a, uh, a match. It ignited fabric and tissue paper, and it killed 146 women. Most of them were behind locked doors. Most of them were in poorly um, ventilated spaces. Most of them were um, in, in, in terrible working conditions. It was only after this terrible tragedy that key labor and safety regulations not, they had them before, but they actually started getting enforced and they started being regulated. People started installing sprinkler systems and fire alarms. My point is this, is that only after a fire did people actually want to change. Until we see the raging fire in our lives, until we see the problems with how we handle intimacy and singleness and marriedness and lust and needs and desires, until we see that the way our culture goes about this, the way I go about this, is not actually healthy. We're not going to start looking for solutions. You would think that if no marriage, if no, no relationship, no lover, no sex relationship can bring bliss or comfort and security that I need, you would think that we would start looking somewhere else other than to each other. But that's what we need to get to. We need to get to that space. And so whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, I think, we can, I, I think it's fair to be able to say the way we go about relating to each other, it's not healthy. And I put my, we have to put ourselves all in that same boat. All right, last point then. Fine. Thanks a lot, Mike. What's the solution? Where do we go from here? Right? If lust consumes, if it uses, if it commodifies, what will actually fix us? Well, Jesus, when he talks about sex and marriage in the Bible, often uses a, an image. And that image is that of a bridegroom. He, he relates himself as a bridegroom. And that's important because if you take one of the top three images of the Bible of how God wants to relate to his people, is he re- wants to relate as a bridegroom relates to his bride. That means that that's the relation God wants with us. You shouldn't want to relate to somebody physically unless you want to also relate to them personally on every level because Only when you not just see somebody physically naked, but you see all their other nakedness, all their other foibles and vulnerabilities and issues, and you stay, that's when that person can feel fully known and fully loved. And so when Jesus calls himself the bridegroom, he's making a promise to us. He is saying, there's only one person who can fully accept you and love you and serve you because there's only one person who can know you to your core, know all your issues, see you better than you see yourself and say, I'm still, I'm still in. I still want to stay. I still want to be here for you. I still want to love you and accept you. Only he, therefore, can give you the love and acceptance that you ultimately need. Jesus is saying this. He's saying, yes, I've come to fight the powers of sin and death. Yes, I've paid your ransom. Yes, I've, cast, I've been cast out so that you can be brought in. Yes, I took the punishment that you deserve for all the ways that you dehumanize each other, that you treat each other and commodify each other, that you just take from bits and pieces, but you don't fully accept and love. And that means he's, he fights the powers. He pays the price. He bears the exile. He uh, takes the punishment which is why we talk about him as a king and savior. But guess what? Until you believe the gospel, he he cannot be the lover of your life. And the reason why that's important is because to the degree that he actually is the lover of, of your life, will you be able to love the other loves of your life well? I'm all for people loving people. I'm all for people caring and serving. I'm saying it's hard to do that when, I'm, when I need to take from you to get for me. But when Jesus gives, when he says, I've given you myself, I've given you all, I've seen it all, I've loved you all fully and completely, that lets you then freeze you 
That when you're in a relationship that doesn't work out, you don't fall apart. That when you're in a marriage, that when it gets tough, you won't get bitter at that, that marital status. Or expect too much from others. Or, or think that any one person can give you what you ultimately need. See, that, I think that's the crux of the issue in our culture right now. Culture is saying in, in loud, bold words to each other, just find that one person or, or multiple people and you'll be all right. And the Bible's sweetly saying, I'm so sorry, there's nobody out there that's going to be able to do that for you. But there is one who did. And he's come for you. And if that's actually true, and if we accept that and take it in to the degree that we do, we're changed. Now some of you are sitting here saying, Michael, but you don't understand. If what you're saying is true, what you're asking me to do then is potentially never, if I stay single my whole life, then potentially never have sex. If you, it means widowed people have to, we have to sit in our grief of what once was. Married people have to sit in the incompleteness and that marriage is not what it was as great as it could be. It's not as fulfilling as you want it to be. And Michael, you're asking for too much. But here's the thing. If you think Jesus is asking too much, then you don't realize what he's actually offering. You don't realize that what his love and faithfulness is worth. That doesn't mean, let me be very clear, that doesn't mean there's not laments. I hope that a church can be a place where we can lament about what's been done to us, about what we've done to others. But it means that we can, in, that, in the context of a love that lasts, a commitment that will never leave you, an identity that's unshakable, a happiness in him that's not based on changing circumstances. Those truths in our heart lets us then be able to be in these other spaces without falling apart. In other words, this. I believe in every set of arms, in every beautiful face, in every adventure, in every sense of success or achievement, what we're really looking for is his face to see us to our core, to know every aspect of who we are, and still say, I want to be with you. I mean, actually, technically, we would do that with anybody, but nobody can do that except for one, and we have that in him. And that because of that, the beauty of your life is when we live that out. Will we do it perfectly? No. But can we do it together? Yes. So let me end with a few practical applications. Number one, accept joy. If, if you look at your life right now and you feel like you're still needing to prove yourself, it's possible you haven't accepted this as your joy. If you're right now bitter at other people and you can't let something go, it's possible you haven't fully accepted this as your joy. If you're burning yourself out, overworking to make it, you might not have made this your joy. If you're, you feel like there's a hole in your heart because you, it, there's no one person that can fill who you are, let this be, accept this joy into your life. You, you will know that he's your real joy when any deprivation of suffering, and there's ma- many of you have suffered and are suffering right now, you've been through a lot, you've lost loved ones, You've been hurt by other people who thought were your loved ones. It doesn't stop that hurt, but what it does mean, if you have him, it doesn't defeat you. Those hurts don't defeat you. Rather, it slams you further into his love as your only hope. Friends, I don't know how to put this bluntly as possible. If you're lucky, you get 80 to 100 years of this world. It goes fast. You don't, sometimes it doesn't feel like that. It goes too slow, but it will go fast compared to the infinite amount of time that you're going to have with him. It's a fraction of the infinity and beauty and wonder that you're going to have in him. If you have a great marriage, that's, all, that's wonderful. Again, a great marriage lasts max 50, 60 years. That's a flash in the pan compared to the infinite time that you're going to have with him. And if you knew that, when the unseen beauties of Jesus become seen, the calculus of what becomes most important to you in this world changes. I believe that maybe some of you grew up here or maybe you moved here, you thought I'd find somebody to get married to, or maybe you moved here married 
and I'm going to take a little bit of the city, and then I'm going to move somewhere cheaper and with more space, whatever. If Jesus is your beauty, if his love is now your, if his love for you is now your love for him, I believe that it will actually change how we make decisions and how, where we stay and where we go and who we get married to. I believe it's possible his beauty and joy changes this plan where you don't need other beauties and joy to the same degree. Do you guys see the resources in that? If, if you're not a Christian and you want freedom here, what's more free, freeing than realizing that this is the source of true contentment? That if Jesus now is our greatest joy and, and Jesus is love, people the most, the more you gaze on him, the more you're going to be able to love and serve other people. I think secular culture thinks that if you gaze on Jesus too much, it takes you out of the world. I disagree. The more you gaze at Jesus, the more you find his love enthralling and enthralling it to you, the more you're going to move out in the world and serve and love because you're going to share. You're going to be free to. You're not going to be so full of navel gazing because you're going to be gazing at him and gazing out at others. I think that's what's beautiful. You, if you have this in your life, we will love others for who they are and not just who we think that they need to be for us. We would be slower to need stuff and quicker to help others in their need. To put it bluntly, seeing Jesus places, place his joy into our joy lets us now place our joy into the joy of others. Have you accepted that joy? Not just in, in word, not just think, you know, you're here sitting here, but has this actually become the active experience of your life? Last application, accept his love for you. And the way you do that is you make him, the, make him the center of your life. That means don't just sprinkle a little bit of Jesus here and there. When this becomes the driving force of your life, the ground by which we're known and loved, that then lets us be able to love and, and it puts the loves of other in the proper place. So if you're a single person and you desire to be married, I think that's a good desire. But you know what? Knowing and experiencing his love and grace for you will keep you from over needing somebody else's love or needing to use somebody else to feel love or linking yourself to somebody who doesn't have him as their love. You can get married to somebody who's not your ideal. How many people... It's always hard, by the way, when I meet with folks and people are, 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 I'm like, hey, who's your ideal? And they tell me their ideal. I'm like, there's less than 1% chance you're ever going to find that person. <laughs> Jesus as the center of your heart it means you, marriage isn't looking for somebody to find to, that's going to be perfect and, and ideal. I think that's actually lust. Lust is looking for a person for looks and for money, for what you can do with them. But if Jesus is the only perfect lover of your soul, then find somebody else who... Jesus is the love of their soul. And then you get excited for what Jesus is doing in their, their life, and they might get excited about what Jesus might do in your life. And that's marriage. Pushing and pulling each other towards the cross. You will always be unhappily unmarried or unhappily married if you're asking for the marriage what it can't give you. So the last thing to say for those who, if you are married, and there's the ups and downs of marriage, Knowing Jesus is the true love of your soul lets you not need more from the marriage than what it can give you. And it gives you space to say, let's work on this. When you have confidence in him, you can have confidence that you're always worried about working on something because it means you're going to have to work on yourself, they're going to have to work on themselves. It takes a lot of effort. But you can say, I'm not feeling the love from you and I'm not sure you're really <laughs> feeling it from me. But we have it from him, and so let's do this together. That's what I mean by how this is a beautiful possibility if we let it. Let the love of Jesus, the true love of your soul, move deeper into your life, and it will change everything. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a hard topic. It's, it's hard because there's so much hurt the church has done hurt in this space. They've, we, I should not say they, we haven't articulated well the beauty and wonder possible that's found in a, in, a, in a fully open, naked in all possibility space. 
And part of the problem is, is that we, we assume the problem's out there, the, the problem's over here. Father, the problem's in our own hearts, where we've all done it and are still doing it. When we freely admit that, I think that changes the conversation. I pray that we will in this, in this space. But help us to receive your grace. You're not, uh, you do not unknow. You didn't, you're not in the dark about our issues. You see us and say, I've spent my entire life to get close to you. you you've waited through eternity to come and live and die for us. And when we make that the core of who we are, I, it moves us. Father, if we're not a Christian here today, I pray that we would consider, well, what's the alternative? How do we not use people? How do we not uh, commodify them? Help us to see Christians, we do this anyway. Help us to confess that, but see how your love changes us and moves us away into spaces where we can fully serve and love others. Amen.